as well. So the last presenter for today is uh, Cindy McKenzie. Uh, she's the um, CIO for Deluxe Entertainment. Uh, Cindy, I think everybody knows Cindy. No introductions. <laughs> and Okay, so I think um, mine will tie in very much with the speakers before, so hopefully I'm a, uh, will make sense as an ending here. So um, I've been at Deluxe, I think, 10 months now, um, or 11, not that I'm counting moments, days, and minutes, but I think I am. Um, and uh, our transformation's really been around transforming IT as quickly as we can to fuel a digital transformation that we're in the midst of. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Deluxe, for those who don't know us, and the entertainment companies will. Um, talk about a, a company that was disruptive, and this that disrupted, and this goes to what Steve said. Deluxe was a uh, physical film lab. So Deluxe and Technicolor were the two major um, film labs. They did not have to sell. They didn't have to do anything. They just printed money, right? Everybody who had a movie came and said, you know, uh, um, copy and distribute my movie, and there were two players. So there, there really was nothing there, you know, in terms of uh, sales organization or any of those things. They were a huge cash cow. Um, and thank God they got ahead of the curve, um, and uh, when the um, film distribution completely went away very, very quickly and moved to digital, um, they had uh, survived by buying a bunch of companies. When, when I got there, there's, um, they have 30 different companies, 30 different brands under the umbrella, very similar to Steve. There are similarities, there are also differences, but it, it really was this whole, let, let's just acquire everything in the post-production business and we'll be everything to everyone. But, um, and the, the goal now, obviously, is to have an end-to-end -end, um, digital distribution platform. So this is hard to see. It's our marketing slide. But the, the takeaway is, here is all the brands. And literally, our brands compete against each other, or did, uh, six months ago. So we'd have one brand bidding on a job with Sony, and the other brand would bid against it at different pricing, which was a little nuts. We're in 12 countries, so we're global, 7,400 people, not, you know, not farmer size, but not teeny. Um, and uh, we, we own a big portion of the business that we do. We're the, you know, one of the biggest providers in the post space and all the large studios, Netflix, Amazon, et cetera, um, use, use our services. So this is, you know, our, we really are an end-to-end -end service provider. So everything from the time the, you know, movie's shot or the TV show's shot, all we do visual effects, we do color, we do, you know, all of those services. Then we do all the transformation to all the different formats, um, distribution, we do digital cinema, we do IP broadcasting, We're, we um, do over-the-top services, like Stars is actually us. So we have pretty much anything that you can think of in the post-production space, we, we have as part of what we do. And, you know, the, the idea being a, a, a customer can come in and really get any of the services that they need to do to get their um, content out the door, distributed to platforms, et cetera. So the industry continues to change um, exponentially. Um, entertainment, and you all know it because you consume it, right? And you know how you consume differently than, than you used to. And so um, increased content globally. There was a study, I think it's FX Networks, that between 2009 and today in the US, the amount of content that's delivered per year has doubled. So, and if you think about it, you know, du uh, DirecTV produces content, Hulu produces content, Amazon produces, everybody produces content. And so, you know, the amount of that content is exponential, thereby obviously affecting us. The, a number of formats, same thing, everybody expects to um, um, get their content on any device that they're on. All those devices, all those platforms uh, require different content formats. Um, the big one that's affecting us right now, probably by far the biggest, is increased globalization of content. And what that's about is the concept that, um, and I'll, I'll use Amazon, because Amazon's the one most driving the business with us right now. And so what used to happen when Amazon would deliver content in another country, they would deliver it in English. They, they weren't um, uh, making that 
you know, language specific in the country. And earlier this year, they decided they were going to take every piece of content that they had, either uh, current or, or catalog, and uh, put that out in the language. And if you think about that, that's, that's, um, that's not just systems. That's how do I find translators who can do, you know, uh, Hindi to English or, you know, <laughs> and in some of the countries getting the, the talent is actually the issue, is how, how do I get the languages? Changing standards, standards constantly change in media and entertainment. Right now we're dealing with, you know, things like 4K, 8K, IMF, which is a, a packaging um, format standard that's affecting us very, very much right this minute. And all of those things just kind of happen and we have to react to those. And then um, the other big one that's affecting us is probably decreasing windows. And so that's actually something we're trying to get ahead of right now. So you can think about it both in terms of the windows for theatrical releases, and there's a lot of discussion. Actually, there's been a lot in the paper over the last um, uh, month about the fact that you know everybody expects us to move to day and date. So, and I personally, I don't know about anybody else, I would much rather see my uh, content at my house and pay 50 bucks than go to the theater. Um, and so, you know, that window, shutting down those windows, and the same thing is, as you know, TV's the same thing. You know, you used to watch a series, you know, every day. <laughs> now the content on OTT providers is released in a day. Right? And so if you think about how somebody who's a servicer of content, how all of this change affects us, it's, it's, it's exponential, right? And so what, how much content we had to get out for the same providers, now we have to do it, you know, X million different ways and with more content, et cetera. So, you know, I, I put this in because this is what I feel like my life is, right? I'm, I'm, I'm changing the tire while the car is moving. And so, you know, what I talk, what, what the issue is here is, right, all, that's, all, all those things are happening in the industry, right? And at the same time, you know, we got a new CEO 18 months ago, John Wallace. And um, John Wallace came from NBCU. NBCU is a GE company. Um, he started there as a page. And uh, his first job other than uh, NBCU is Deluxe. Deluxe is a lot like Marillo Group. Right? We bought 30 companies. We never integrated them. There's a huge amount of technical debt. Um, and he thinks, and still to this day, I keep trying to convince him. I spend more time trying to convince him what the size of what he just asked for is because he thinks he can do it just like he did at MBCU, which was a lovely, homogenized, you know, mature organization. And you know, he, he asked for something simple, and it, nothing's ever simple. At Deluxe. And so not only are we dealing with all of this, how do I deal with this hugely increased uh, content? We were actually turning around, turning away business six months ago because we could not process globalization, that whole globalization, subtitling, dubbing, um, and compliance formatting, which is, you know, in certain countries, you have to take out certain kinds of content. That, that whole business was just craziness, and we were turning away work right and left. And so John, you know, one, came from a studio, so he saw everything from a customer perspective, right, because he used to be a customer of Deluxe's, which is lovely, right, he's very customer, customer journey um, centric. And then, as well, he just wanted to change us to be a digital platform company. But he wants to do that tomorrow. At the same time, we're trying to produce all this content out the door with a huge amount of technical debt. It's, it's a fun ride. Um, and so really we've spent a lot of time on, you know, how, how, can we, how can we do this? And I don't think this was supposed to be the next slide, but, you know, a lot of it's been around, did I skip one? Okay. Um, how do we do our products in a small, smaller way, right? And so this whole, you know, minimal viable product thing, you know, how do we come up with simple solutions that meet the business needs and that we can deliver in a quicker manner? And, and really, a lot of what we've been doing is the foundations to let us to, to do this. Because when you're in a highly siloed, fragmented organization, you can't deliver <laughs> simply elegant solutions very easily. This was a slide I thought was before. So this is really what we've spent time on. And that is putting business agility into the organization. And, and you know, this vision... The vision, not the practicality of it, came from the CEO, right? I need, I need to be able to do this stuff as quickly as we can. And how do we get there as, as an organization? 
So we've put in a lot of work around how do we manage and, and, and view the market so that we understand these market changes. And so being ready for increased globalization when globalization hits, being ready to understand the format changes and be able to have the infrastructure in order to support that before it hits. Um, as well, and I think uh, uh, we talked about this earlier, this issue of is there stuff out in the market that can help us to get to, to, to where we need to get faster? We don't have to build it ourselves if it, if it exists. So we spend a lot of time on new technology and new technology startups. And I'll give an example of that. Actually, I'll do it now. So I, I think week two I was at Deluxe, they said, we want to buy this company. Can you get involved? You, you know, you've done this before. Can you do the due diligence on the technical platform? And then we want to do the di due diligence on the how it will fit into the business. And it was a platform called Safera. Um, it was a very small company that had built a platform that automated the localization process. I mean, Everything that Deluxe was doing manually, they had automated. So all the quality control checking, all that was automated. But the really secret sauce was crowdsourcing the translation talent. So they had set up a platform that allowed um, translators to sign themselves up um, for the platform. They could take tests. Um, and then they, they kept getting scored based on how many errors that they had. And then they could put their schedules in. And the system would automatically schedule them into these translation activities. And so what was a really difficult thing for us to do became a piece of cake, right? And so that change alone, and we ended up buying that. So you know, <laughs> we, we did move fast, and we bought that company. That's what's allowed us to go from turning away the localization to work to right now. I actually just checked to this. We haven't turned any work away in the last three months. And we would not have been able to do that if we had tried to build this. We would have been too late to the market. So, and I spend a lot of my time with the senior management team looking at products in the market that we might be able to plug and play. And it's more what Deluxe used to buy was capability, operational capability, you know, like creative services, et cetera. What we're buying now is technology for the most part. Um, and I'll talk about some of the ones that, that we've looked at. So that's a whole like loop that's happening that we have a whole group doing. We do it on a regular, like a, honestly, a daily basis. Um, communication was a really big issue that we had um, in that, again, and I, I don't remember who Steve may, may have said this, you know, the, there wasn't an articulated business strategy. There wasn't an articulated technology strategy. Um, and then, you know, that whole thing about leaders versus managers, we really had managers and, and we didn't have leaders and that we didn't have people who understood. We were very hierarchical and we were very, again, siloed. And then last was really how do we build that agility into the organization? And that was really about putting together, again, when you're as siloed as we are, you cannot have an end-to-end -end, you know, customer journey for production if you don't process re-engineer, right? I can't build a system that goes across 30 businesses without doing process re-engineering across 30 businesses who don't want to work together. Yeah. Sounds like that, that train was moving, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you got there and uh, the business was uh, scared to start hiring people? No. The CEO was ahead of everyone. No one was, a, no. The business is, was just as messed up as, as the IT organization. And literally, it, I've been there 11 months. In the 11 months I've been there, every single president has changed. And we don't have, I don't know how many you said you had, 13 or something? I have seven now. There were more. Um, now there are seven presidents. So, and you know, trying to corral them is still a large part of my job. So, I mean, that was going to be my follow up question is that it, it, you know, if IT, there's only so fast you can go if the business doesn't go with you. You know, how fast are you able to go if you're emailing or video chain to make that happen? Yes. So, John sees technology, John Wallace, our CEO, sees technology as being key to what he's doing. And so he really does honestly want to, everything's driven by technology with him. And so literally, as I said, in that first decision that was being made the second week I got there, and he, you know, he kind of knew me 
barely, right? You know, I was sitting there help, uh, making the decision as to whether we should buy that or not, right? And so at this point, you know, there's an executive management committee. I do sit on that. Um, so every strategy meeting that takes place, I'm in. And like, you know, literally, I just stopped them from buying a company last week that I just couldn't understand the business value or, or what the proposition was. And I just kept questioning and questioning and questioning until they gave up on it. Right, and it happened to be something I knew um, very, very well from my studio days. So I, and they didn't like the only two studio people there are me and the CEO. So th there is an interesting perspective that the people that have been on both sides of the house have that I think sometimes the people who've only been in and one side don't don't have. So process reengineering, we have a team that reports to me doing that across the company for all the major things. So if we're dealing with this IMF new format, which makes major changes in process, business, and technology, my team's leading that. Uh, my team led the whole Severa acquisition. My team leads, we're doing this one workflow initiative to come up with one workflow. My, my team runs those. Um, the business development framework is this, how do we look at products, how are we, you know, how are we vetting them, how are we deciding whether we bring them in, and then even though we're bringing them in, how do we integrate them to get the value as quickly as we need? And, you know, for that one specifically, you know, we, we've done, I think, a really good job of doing cross-functional teams. So it, these are not, again, not hierarchy, more team. So you know, on a, the Safara decision and integration, you know, there was a team that dealt with that that was, you know, me, the head of sales, legal, um, the development team, because we knew we wanted to make changes to the platform to be able to do more than it did, you know, and so there was, you know, six people with a, you know, plan that we were expected to put into place the day that transaction closed. Um, and then this is key, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, yeah. On the cross-functional team, uh, yeah. who makes the decision? Uh, is it you that recommends to the CEO, or is it the cross-functional team that says, we should buy this company? I don't know if you're The cross-functional team makes the decision. Okay, makes the decision. Yeah. Uh, or makes the, honestly, the CEO makes the decision. <laughs> but we make the recommendation to him um, on what they should do. And for that, for example, we, we just, you know, sat in meeting after meeting, week after week, and we presented him both those plans, because part of it is the whole business model on the financials was based on, you know, rolling out some new products with that team. Um, you know, we had, to, they actually licensed their software to other providers as well as servicing. We didn't want to do that anymore because then we're, you know, bastardizing our own business. Those decisions all, we had to explain why we came to the decisions we did. And so right now they're looking at buying four more companies and you know, we put together the exact same group, we're doing the same analysis. And part of what we're trying to do is templatize those processes so they're not a, oh, look, I have to do an acquisition, what do I do? You know. And how many people are in that team? Um, the Safara team had maybe six. Um, the one now probably, it's honestly it's the exact same people. So it's the same exact people. And then nimble system architecture. Again, I can't impress upon you how siloed this, this place was. I mean, every single workflow. So if you think about uh, one of my businesses is visual effects, and then another one of my businesses is localization. They had completely different infrastructure, completely different systems, completely different everything. And so you can't do a digital transformation like that. And so what we've come up with this is a architecture framework that allows us to plug and play pieces. And, and because we're building it that way, not only can we plug and play specific things, like if you need render software for creative and you don't need it for delivery, you want to plug that into the overall framework. But as well, if we buy something, we can plug it in, right? We don't, we don't, we're building it in that framework. So the, this, this is just illustrative. When I got there, um, there was me. And then there was, and there were more than this, there were all these CTOs, right? And for those who came from studios, they understand post-production. Post-production is mostly engineers um, by nature because it used to be more film-based. And so they're heavy-duty engineers. And so <laughs> literally every time I turned around, somebody else would walk up and say, oh, I want to meet you. I'm the CTO for so-and-so. I'm the CTO for so-and-so. I'm the head of technology for so-and-so. And John 
said, I hired a CIO, she's in charge. But in reality, he had all these other people and didn't really want to mandate that they went away. Um, and so, you know, that was my world 10 months ago. Yeah. Yeah, I do have to say, using our past analogies, I was the shared services head for Fox, 13 Fox companies, more than that at one point. It was a really good learning experience for this problem, right? And so all these people existed. And again, post-production is very male-dominated, more than any other thing I've seen other than going to Cisco or something. And so, like, it, <laughs> I... I literally, minus, you know, people in sales and stuff, I'm the only lone woman there. Um, and so this is what it's evolved to right now. And so what's happened, um, and it, it works really well for us, and if you see the little family analogy there, that's actually kind of true. <laughs> so quickly I made friends with the uh, head of apps engineering. He builds product. He was in the same boat as me. He ran DOD only, which is our OTT platform. Um, he, he built that. He didn't own anything else. John wanted him to take over engineering, and he wanted me to take over everything else. And, but he didn't want to mandate it. And so, you know, we just started, I just started taking it nicely. Um, and that's all about relationship building, right? Oh, it'd be great if you were over here. Look at the synergies we would get. Wouldn't that be great? And, you know, I started sucking up everything I could. And so <laughs> where we are now is Alan and I have come into this lovely relationship, and this is all about product and, you know, um, that. In my perfect world, I would do everything Alan does, too, because I love building product, but I don't now. I still have apps, but I have boring corporate apps. But him, he can't survive without me. And honestly, I can't survive without him. And we learned that really early on. And I must talk to him every single day. I mean, he's like my work husband, hence the diagram. Um, we then put in, um, and I, literally, they had the same structure internationally. We've um, consolidated on at you know, kind of Cindy nicely pushing, um, a single head for each of the regions, and they dotted line, they uh, solid line into the uh, region, but they dotted line into me, and I'm making that more of a solid by the moment. There's a CTO for visual effects, which that's building visual effects software. That shouldn't be anywhere but there. And then there's like one or two left of the other guys, and all the rest of them have either been sucked into Alan's organization or my organization or are gone in 10 months. And honestly, the only way we could get to a standardized platform is to do that. I, I, you know, I really do believe that. I'm not at all an empire builder, but we couldn't get to where they wanted us to get without homogenizing. <laughs> My work husband is six foot five, <laughs> and I'm five foot three. So, and actually, half of the, not only are they all men, they're all tall. So, yeah. I'm not. And that's, you know, that's actually part of what I was trying to, to talk about on the, the, the car and the tire. So, and, and a lot of it has to do, again, with our CEO's expectations, right? I mean, I swear to God, I'm in a strategy meeting every, every other week. And, uh, you know, I, I have a mess that I'm trying to fix. And I have people who've been here 30 years who don't know any better than what they're doing. And honestly, I need them because they have legacy knowledge. And until I replace legacy, I, I can't survive without a lot of them. So it, it's, a, it's a really difficult balance. It, it really is. Um, but it it's kind of has to happen. Right? So you just kind of suck it up and get it done. And a lot of it's relationship building, right? So I, I, I swear to God I wouldn't be where I am right now and alive and still surviving it at Deluxe if I hadn't made some strategic you know, alliances. And I don't mean it in that kind of survivor alliance. But you know, let's work together. It's the only way we're going to get through this. And you know, something as simple as John decided he wanted to do performance reviews six weeks before he wanted them done. And um, he was adamant um, that it happened. We didn't have a system. I don't have, a, honestly, what I would consider a hardcore developer on my entire team. And John doesn't get that, right? Cindy, I want this. Can you build this? I need it. You, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, 
okay. And so I could design it. I've done 8,000, as people who know me know, I've done 8,000 HR systems. So like designing it took 10 minutes. But I called Alan and begged Alan, and be Alan built it for me, right? So it's, it, it, that whole relationship thing is, is really the only way this has worked. So part of what Alan and I have spent a lot of time on is communicating what we do and how things are changing and how people work together. And so already twice at these senior management meetings, we, we go off site once a quarter for a week. Uh, I go to India Sunday morning um, to do one of these. And so I've had to redo how we work together and what our orgs do because it keeps changing as fast as, as we get there. So the model we put together was really this idea of, you know, the, the strategy is really driven by a combination of the tech sides and the business, because we're so technology driven, you can't not have the tech side and the strategy. Then we build, um, combined this um, architecture and um, the strategy and roadmap, and then push that to the regions. Now, that, that was different. The regions considered themselves the same as a line of business. And so we've been really pushing that they're not a line of business. They don't get the same say. They get to participate, but they got to kind of come along with everybody else. And then you can't see this, but this, I, somebody showed a slide like this. Well, this is how we're explaining what capabilities we do. And then what, and it used to be three, right? There used to be production engineering, me, and um, innovation, which is Alan's apps, in a, uh, apps engineering group. So there were three, we've sucked up one. Um, but we're always trying to communicate what we each do versus what we don't do for folks. I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, the governance model, again, this is a company that didn't work together, so right away in the first month, we put together a number of councils. So Alan put together an apps engineering council to put in standard apps standards and make sure everybody was building so that we could plug and play what was building out of these groups. I put together um, a council for project green lighting because, again, we weren't controlling across the company where the investments were being made, and not even investments with money. It was people, right? Like, if you're going to put 200 people on a project, that's still an opportunity cost, right, even though there's no money out of the door. And then we put together an apps engineer, uh, uh, production engineering council, so all technology purchases had to go through this council. And I now have to sign off every technology purchase that happens in the company, which, by the way, the amount of capital we spend on hardware is craziness. Um, and so that, that's actually by itself a full-time job, reviewing all their hardware purchases and deciding whether I'm going to let them buy stuff or not, right? Um, so, and then the last one we put in place is I refuse to let the – and I've – We've had this talk at other companies. I've been in this executive council to make decisions. And in a lot of cases, you don't really need it. In this case, with seven line of businesses, we needed it. And so, you know, from the very beginning, I make them every decision we make on the roadmap, I make them all get in a room and I make them all agree. And then, so we're in, we're in with them pretty regularly showing them the roadmap. And if they come with something new, I make them all buy off on what they're taking out. And so that actually is working really well. Um, and I do this just for funny illustration. So Alan, my work husband, when uh, you know he was asked to do a demo early on to our, our, our relationship on his one workflow concept. So this is our plug and play architecture, right? And I looked at his thing and I said, well, where's all my stuff? I'm like, you can put this up, but you know I'm actually, if you're going to get from what was the bid to how much profitability did we have on the bid, you can't ignore me, right? Like, your, your, your thing doesn't really work, right? I have to do the sales at the front. I have to do the labor because we're mostly labor, right? It's a professional services firm, really. You know, all the money, all the time tracking to get to project costing. I do all the invoice and billing to customers, no matter what workflow system, and then our big behemoth under the whole thing, which is business intelligence. So all I did, this took five minutes, but it's been a little bit of a hit, and so they use it all the time to be illustrative of the process. But again, this is getting this company to start to think end to end, because they, they, they didn't. So organizational governance, I, I think a lot of this is going to resonate with the things that were said, hopefully, in terms of best practices. I think, I, I think we're doing a few of them, at least. Um, organizational realignment, that's you know the centralization of services. I also, when I got there, there was no PMO, none, zero. There was no PMO, no PMO methodology. There were no business analysts. 
Um, we were the most order-taking group I've ever seen in my life. I sat in my first meeting, and the business was running a Kukur um, implementation, t and &E. IT was sitting there going, well, what do you want that interface to look like? And I'm, I walk out in the meeting. I'm like, what the, are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, who's running this project? And like, what, what, what are we trying to do? Have you, has, does anybody know what they're doing? And they're like, no. And they had no concept. They just thought they were supposed to sit there and take an, an order for an interface, right? And honestly, they didn't have the skills to do much more than that uh, when I got there. And so that, that organizational realignment happened. Um, I, you know, we put in the, the PMO, we put in that business process group, we put in um, business solutions directors, which for the, my Sony days, I was a beetle at one point, I hate to admit, which was, you know, it's like a business relationship manager at a senior level. I'm putting those in. Right now I'm hiring for those. Um, staffing, again, right when I got there, everybody does it when they first get so somewhere, you do a skills assessment. I did a skills assessment and had shock and awe. Um, and said, oh my God, what am I doing? And, and so literally, because you know, we're trying to upskill the skills we have, I'm trying to feed in the skills we're missing, um, and we're doing a huge training effort. Like nobody even knew what ITIL was, right? I'm half, more than half my organization is infrastructure and they didn't, God forbid, ITSM. They, they, they didn't understand it. You couldn't even have a conversation because they didn't understand the concepts, right? So I've made everybody get ITIL certified and then we'll move to ITSM. Um, communication was our biggest um, stumbling block. When I went out to the business, and I, you know, we all do the same thing. I went interview uh, interviewed every single one of the business heads. They said, I don't know what you do. I don't know what your team does. I don't think they work very hard. I mean, seriously. And like my team was running around like chickens, and we were running, you know, like by a, over 100 projects, right? But we didn't talk to anybody. We didn't communicate. Nobody met with the business regularly. So immediately I put together a plan that everybody who reports to me had to commit to. They were all assigned specific people that they had to meet with on a regular basis, and it's part of their incentive. Right, so not only do I meet with every single, and there's way too many of them, you know, it's very hard to meet with every president when there's a bunch of them, right, on a regular basis. But I meet with every single president, I meet with every one of those, te the left technology leaders regularly, but then I also make my next layer do it and my next layer do it. And so we're hitting the organization uh, very much. And actually it's funny because they're, they're, they're think that John thinks we're like now creating this big shared services organization and he was yelling at everybody in a meeting a couple of weeks ago and he said the only group who's doing communication is right is Cindy Sue. And it's because, you know, I'm a firm believer in you just have to talk, 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 right? And so, and we put out, part of that for me was putting out monthly reporting on every project, every SLA. Um, all of that we now do. We built a dashboard, all our SLAs and, you know, all of our service metrics. I can see online real time. Like, am I meeting the SLAs I agreed to? You know, and, and there's a lot of work to do. But in terms of transparency, we're transparent. Good, bad, ugly, I want them to see it, right? And honestly, I can't fix it or get an investment to fix it unless somebody sees the need. And you don't see the need if you don't see the numbers. Um, metrics and reporting kind of goes with what I just talked about. There were no SLAs when I got there. And um, you know, we set SLAs. We've been meeting with the business to go through the SLAs and get agreement and report on them. Um, we've, uh, we're just in the process of putting in a, uh, somebody else said this too, yeah. a dashboard that's an electronic dashboard that allows, um, create, takes all the projects and uploads them into an overall dashboard. You can see overall metrics, and then you can click into a project to see any project. Then you can click into it and see the very details. What's the risk? What's the, and it, to me, it wasn't the tool for the project management. I don't care whether somebody uses, you know, project or smart sheets or whatever. I wanted a dashboard. And what that gave me was a dashboard that the business can see all projects. And I made, there's still PMOs in the business. Some of them are for business projects. And there, we got agreement that everybody's using one thing. CEO will be able to log on at any moment and see the uh, progress on any project and the metrics against those projects. And then management controls, we talked about the councils. Um, that, that was a big part of management controls, really just, you know, getting more visibility into what we were doing across the company and just, you know, forcing this kind of governance and communication. 
So we talked a little bit about this, but you know, this goes to my concept and customer journey. When we got there, we were very hierarchical, and we, then we were hierarchical and siloed. So there were seven LOB, well, there, I think when I first got there, there was probably 14 LOB presidents. Now there's seven line of business presidents, and there probably should be two. Um, but there's still seven. And, um, and then there's, there were all these IT organizations. And so some, a lot of that's consolidated. It's still too much. But we are using completely this team-based approach to all product, all you know, business development decisions, all of like new formats, all of it. Everyone's got a cross-functional team of senior management that's going across. And, and that's really speeding us and helping the coordination to, to get all the teams together to actually uh, realize the benefits. So uh, I think you were talking about UCLA. No offense to UCLA. When I was at News Corp, they had a relationship with MIT to put their IT leadership through. So Peter is one of the big professors at, um, in that program. I, I like him very much, not anywhere near as much as <laughs> I don't hug Peter. <laughs> um, and so, you know, Pete, one of the things that Peter says all the time is that a higher degree of process and technological standardization allows you to be more agile. And if you heard what I was saying, that's what we're doing, right? So we're spending a lot of time on process standardization and this, again, um, building a plug and play framework because I think it's the only way we can actually react fast enough. And again, you know, these things are, you know, happening. Like, the, seriously, the, Amazon called, I don't know, November, December, some, some point, and said, I'm going to give you all of our business next month, right? But we were already turning away business. And so, you know, we have, we've got to react faster or we lose, you know, we lose our opportunities. And if we didn't take that business, somebody else would have, and we may have never gotten it back. And so getting everything ready so we can make these changes fast enough and we're ahead of them, I think is really, really key. And then IT is an enabler of value-added services. So this is really that how do we productize IT? How do we get IT into, into the business discussions? As I said, we're there. Um, which sometimes I wish I wasn't, because <laughs> it, it is, as you said, very, very, very time consuming, right? And it's hard when I'm trying to deal with operational stuff, keeping the lights on, and, and trying to sound really you know, articulate on why we should buy one thing or another, right? Or why we should you know, get into this. We're actually looking at business lines. Do we sell off stuff? You know, where, where do we think the business is going? What do we think our customers need? Um, and you know. You can't walk into that stuff unprepared, right? Um, and so we are at that uh, point. We are, a lot of it has to do with technology, and it's a, a lot of the same stuff we talked about. For us, it's really about customer portals. We want customers to be able to get in, log on, order whatever they want from Deluxe, see um, the status of every order as it's going through the chain so that they can, you know, see where it sits. Um, and then, um, uh, then get billed for it out the end. Believe it or not, them getting billed automatically is a huge thing that everybody wants. And so, you know, my team's building that. And, you know, not only do, do, do they want those things, but the other thing that we're spending a lot of time on is analytics. And again, you know, anybody who has a significant market share, they have data that's valuable, right? And we own a big, large portion of this um, market. And we have... We have it, it's very difficult for us to tap right now because it's siloed across these systems. But we're trying, we're making a lot of progress on pulling data together to give insight. And I'll, I'll give a simple one. It's, and we, we service both sides. So we service both content providers, right? So I build content, I give it to Deluxe. We also service the people who receive it, right? And the, one of the biggest issues is the receivers don't know when something's coming. You know, so that we may be giving status to the person who ordered it from us, but we're not giving status to the person receiving it. They don't know when it's coming. It just shows up. And so the data that we have, we can, you know, turn into something that's valuable to both sides of the equation. And, and that's, that's really valuable. And again, that's how do you understand your market? What is it that you have access to that might be valuable? How do you mine that and put that together? 
and again, my team's in those discussions, and we're you know moving <laughs> as fast as we can to do all these things at the same time. So you know, data analytics is a huge initiative that we have. The you know that one workflow and how that happens, all the and all these acquisitions all are happening with the changes in market. Is that data analytics across all the business, all the units? Yes. One yes. Dashboard. Yes. We are doing, so for us, I'm we're not an, data, no, 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 I know. But it, so for us, we're not really an IOT thing, right? That's not really, there's some things we, that make sense for us, some don't. Machine learning is the big thing for us okay. um, because we really need to predict like how much content's going through a pipe and can we support that with the new business that's coming? Because I mean, infrastructure for us is just a huge expenditure. And I can talk about cloud in a second. The, um, and so, doing things that actually allow us to um, predict and forecast is where we're spending a lot of our time. The, the first, because nothing existed, right, and I've been here 10 months, getting the, getting the dashboards out that actually give at least what we're doing versus what we said we were gonna do, that was like a lot of work because that data didn't exist. So we've got that up and working. Um, and now we've got people working on, we've um, hired some data scientists. They're actually doing that um, uh, predictive modeling that we're building into the platform. And so that, and then, and then we're also dealing with this, what is it we think we've got that we can start to pull together for our customers. So, all, so we're doing all three. So the, the, the views are really the customer view. So we're dealing with our customers on the what, so all those dashboards feed into those customer portals to show the customers what we're doing. So a lot of it is, are we delivering to them on time? How often, how, what's the error rate on the product we're giving them? All that stuff is from a customer view. So that's part of what we're doing. And then we have the executive view to allow John to manage the business better. And you know his whole thing is the business is supposed to be managing their business on data, which they weren't, right? And then, because they didn't have it. And then, you know, a, a lot of it's about how do we automate this end-to-end -end process? Because, like, quality control is something that for 90% of the stuff should be automated, right? And so we're, we're you know, we're building all of that in um, as fast as we can, where we think it adds the most value. And right now, it's all those decision makings on, and that goes to the small, you know, minimal viable. Where do we get the biggest bang for this? How do we prove it out? And then, then we'll pick pick the next one. But let's not wait till we can do this enterprise wide. Okay, so I'm going to end on a, just a recent Bob um, Iger quote. And you have to be willing to create or experience some disruption. And this is from three weeks ago, I think. It was at Cable Vision or something. Um, you have to be willing to create or experience some disruption as we migrate from what has been a more traditionally distributed world to a more modern or non. Um, traditional distribution world. So this, this, this market is changing like crazy. And honestly, for I mean, Deluxe made it through the first round of digitization. I honestly believe if we don't create this one single end-to-end -end platform, we'll be dead again in a few years. This, it's, it's, a lot of this stuff we do is automatable. And you know, if we can automate it, if we can provide it, and then we add the talents that we have on top of it and you know, build something that's um, we have, you know, as I said, 12 countries. We can do global work share if we have a single platform, right? We can reduce costs. We can put the best talent around the world on things that we have to do to survive. So to me, we're, you know, we made it once, but we're at the point that we have to make it again in order for us to really be here in, in five more years. So hopefully that was interesting. <laughs> Any question? I'm <laughs> Yes, thank Rich Hoffman. Yeah. Uh huh. So, so can you walk me through a process? I'm curious of what the process was for identifying the priorities, and you know, after stepping in the door, and, and were some of those things just very evident to them and knocked off right away? What I would say is it's been a journey, right? So I did it. I I misunderstood how fast John wanted to change everything. 
And so, and, and you know, I have a boss who's the CFO, but I also report to the CEO, so I meet with him every other week. And my boss's was, this is going to be over time, build some credibility, move this stuff together. John was like, do it tomorrow, right? And so the first month or so I spent, you know, interviewing the business, seeing my team, I made a whole plan together. That was lovely, throw it away, right? Because within another month, it became evident I was taking all these other groups over and my priorities were changing. So it was still valuable, I needed to do that. So, you know, just like I said, Alan and I have presented what we do to the senior management team three times now, and it's, it's different every time. What, what is my focus is changing pretty regularly. I'm a, I have to personally be very agile. Um, so everything I identified the first time did need to be fixed, but in the pri priority of things, some of it isn't gonna get fixed. And I'll give an example, I'm responsible for SAP. I saw our SAP system and I, like, it was another shock and awe, right? We didn't, we're a project company. We didn't have project costing turned on. We didn't have profitability analysis turned on. We can't see the profitability of our jobs. We didn't have procure to pay turned on. I mean, there were 40,000 customers. I'm sorry, anybody who know, is in the studio, we, there's no way we have more than 4,000 customers. We have 40,000 in the system because they let everybody just set them up willy-nilly. So that... So that would have been what I consider one of my number, and honestly, I think it still is one of my number one priorities, but the business doesn't think it is. And uh, I spent months putting together a whole how to re-implement SAP. Do I re-implement or fix SAP? Can I even fix it? And what do I do? It didn't, it didn't make it. So it'll happen probably next year. So, it, you know, it's an evolving, it's an evolving thing. So, um, as I said, the key is talking, talking, talking. So I spent a lot of time with the business, all the time trying to understand the priorities and then re-communicate back to John. Because a lot of what I have to do, I, I hate to say it, is bring John's expectations um, to what I really can deliver and ha have him give some guidance on where he thinks we should be putting the focus. I love being the downer person. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 I've only been here 10 months, so I mean, there's not that much experience against big projects. Where it's helped, though, tremendously is on our delivery to our customers. And so what we've been able to do a lot of work on is, is stuff profitable? Because like a lot of times they were selling and then they didn't know at the end whether or not actually how much it cost versus what they sold it for, so they can see that now. Not in all cases, but in a lot of the cases. So that it's helped with, and it's also helped with our failure rates. But because we've been able to identify where we were having um, issues with quality or whatever, and we were able to target those. So our numbers in terms of um, um, quality and delivering on time, you know, and for us, delivering on time is sometimes it's the difference between hours, right? Because especially for a theatrical release, it's getting distributed especially Christmas, <laughs> you know, it's like it goes that minute, right? And if we're 10 minutes late, it's like the end of the world. And so th that it's helped with a lot. I would say not so much yet with the project green lighting because I, I don't think we've got enough data at, that, at this point to really to do that with. Okay, I can ask her questions afterwards. Thank you so much. You're welcome.